So I'll start with the answer and then go on to explain why this is the case. American democracy is in decline, and if we, the people, fail to amend the Constitution to provide a framework for free and fair elections, our democracy will wither and die. Now, the problem, the mother of all problems, the seminal problem that underlies every issue in modern day America is money. The influence of big special interest money in our electoral system. Here's the whole problem statement on a single slide. Over the past few decades, big money special interests have gained control of our electoral process and therefore the members of our legislative bodies, and therefore our laws. Most people have some sense of this, but a typical comment is, it's always been like this. There have always been corrupt politicians. But what goes unnoticed is the extent of how this control is growing over time. Recognition that democracy can be subverted by the wealthy is not new. Almost 200 years ago, Thomas Jefferson wrote a thoughtful, passionate letter to John Adams making two points. Government must guard against seizure by those with power derived from wealth. He argued that a takeover by the wealthy would amount to a return to rule by the British crown. He went on to suggest that the government should make provisions to attract the best and the brightest to public office a group defined by virtue and merit. And, of course, there was Eisenhower's courageous farewell address, where he warned of the dangers of an overly powerful defense industry tightly coupled with a complicit government. Let's take a few minutes to listen to some of his words. I told it like it was, but little was done in response, and 50 years later, this relationship has become inextricably entrenched. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime, or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together.
Since Eisenhower's warning, other major industries have smelled blood and piled on. The energy industry dumped $48 million on Bush Cheney, and for that modest investment, were rewarded with secret policy sessions with the vice president, resulting in billions in subsidies and environmental exclusions. For a mere $40 million, the pharmaceutical industry held the pen that wrote Medicare Part D, legislation that netted over $300 billion a year in additional revenues. Organized labor pours millions almost exclusively into the coffers of Democrats, and union issues, in turn, consistently bubble to the top of the Democratic agenda. And the real danger is how the grip of big money on our electoral process tightens with each election cycle. We are well past the point where contributions by average citizens make a difference. Take special note of where this money comes from and where it goes. The financial industries provide much more than any other sector. And notice that the split between parties is even. So it really doesn't matter whether Republicans or Democrats win. Both parties are equally indebted to Wall Street, and this indebtedness is reflected in policy. And if you want to know the real differences between the parties, look at the partisan money. Unions, the environment, human rights, and lawyers on the left, religion, guns, fossil fuels, and mineral extraction on the right. It seems that ordinary working Americans have become powerless pawns unable to move from their squares. Has democracy in America joined the Geneva Convention as a quaint artifact of history? Well, this was the question I was pondering when I saw this magazine with a picture of the Capitol Dome covered with corporate logos. And yes, there was the suggestion of a solution. I was intrigued, so I picked it up. The author was Larry Lessig, a man who works in production at the Harvard Lawyer Factory. His analysis is so well constructed, I won't try to compete. Listen to his compelling presentation at a Boston TEDx conference. Sometime before 1846, sometime, someplace near Walden Pond, this man, Henry David Thoreau, wrote this. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. So this is a picture of a 12-year-old boy. It's a picture of an epidemic in America, childhood obesity. This epidemic has exploded in just the past 30 years. Since 1980, we have tripled the number of children who are obese. Children over the age of two now suffer one-third who are categorized as obese. And this epidemic, of course, has costs. The biggest cost is the explosion in type 2 diabetes, a kind of diabetes that used to occur just in elderly people. Now half of the diagnosed cases come from kids. $147 billion annually spent because of this obesity. Now, why is it? We've come to this place. Well, when I was a kid, I was fat. I told my parents it was genetic. It's a little hard, though, to imagine a whole generation being raised through a new genetic mechanism that has somehow turned them into fat. Of course, it's not genetic in this sense. It has everything to do with what we eat. And there's a consensus, of course, here, that we eat too much of this stuff and not enough of this stuff, or more precisely, not actually this, but high fructose corn syrup. 40% of the products in a supermarket today have high fructose corn syrup. Now, why is that? Well, one simple reason is the cost of sugar is high relative to the cost of corn. And the market enamored might say, well, that's the market. It's what the market's telling us, and the market is responding to input costs. But it's not quite like this. In fact, Sugar is expensive because the domestic sugar industry has succeeded in getting tariffs that protect them from foreign trade, benefiting them by $1 billion annually, costing the economy $3 billion annually because sugar costs two to three times the cost in other countries in the United States. And corn 
is so cheap because we subsidize it. $74 billion in the last 15 years, meaning that the cost of producing corn is actually negative, producing a radical shift in the costs of food. So between 1997 and 2003, the cost of vegetables went up by 17%. The cost of a Big Mac dropped by 5.4%. The cost of a bottle of Coke dropped by 35%. And it has radically changed how food gets made. You've all, I'm sure, seen this extraordinary film, Food, Inc., which talks about because corn is so cheap, we can afford to feed cattle corn profitably. Not profitably to the cattle, of course, because cattle can't process corn properly, meaning we have to feed them tons of antibiotics to deal with the diseases that get produced because we feed them corn, meaning we produce plenty of these very cool little superbugs that now produce salmonella in extraordinary rates in ways we can't deal with all because corn is so cheap and sugar is so dear. Why have we gotten here? The simple reason is campaign cash. As the Washington Post, not the New York Times, the Washington Post <laughs> said, 2004, some of the six producers of sugar succeeded through about a million dollars in election contributions to preserve the tariffs that protect them against competition. And of course, ADM has spent over the last 20 years millions of dollars to guarantee that the cost of corn drops dramatically. And so, Campaign money distorts markets, which distorts food production, which distorts our kids. Now, this is just one story. If I had endless time, which I'm told I don't, right? Um, I could go through an endless list of similar stories. Take Wall Street. Everybody now recognizes the bubble that burst last year was in part produced by deregulation of those markets. But what people don't recognize is the way that it was also produced by a certain kind of re-regulation, the way markets signaled or got the signals from the government that the government would guarantee those markets when the bubble burst through a bailout that these companies would get for the loss they suffered. And this combination of regulation and deregulation produced the dumbest socialism man has ever produced. Socialized risk, privatized benefit. We get the risk, they got the benefits. An insanely stupid policy. So why is it we produce that policy? Well, directly at the moment that this policy began to be implemented, there was a skyrocketing in campaign contributions from these sectors, the fastest growing increase in campaign contributions coming from the security sector of any in the nation. Or take this tragedy of the Deepwater Horizon. Many of you, I'm sure, thought like I did, like how could it possibly have been that this could occur? I mean, weren't there environmental impact or risk studies going on here? I mean, after all, when we tried to get the uh, Cape Wind project through, it took nine years and 10,000 pages of environmental impact statements before this project would be approved. How about Deepwater Horizon? How many pages of analysis did the company have to make to get that approved? 17 before it was exempted from any further environmental impact analysis. Now, of course, Congress, when it was told about this, was shocked. Shocked. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody out at once. Yet, of course, it was Congress that had required that they approve these applications within 30 days of their submission because of an endless stream of campaign cash that directed Congress to change that policy. Or think about global warming. Two years after a supermajority in the Senate and a majority in the House and a president committed to doing something about global warming and $110 million spent by people like you supporting this reform, just last week Congress admitted there's nothing that's going to be done about this problem. It has been abandoned for this cycle. As invoking the wisdom of perhaps the last century's greatest philosopher, David Byrne, same as it ever was. Now, in all of these cases, we have good souls hacking at the branches of evil, none striking at the root. But in our history, there have been exceptions to this law of Thoreau. Jefferson was an exception. As he wrote, we should look forward to a time when corruption in this as in the country from which we derive our origin will have seized the heads of government 
and be spread by them through the body of the people when they will purchase the voices of the people and make them pay the price. And about a hundred years after Lincoln spoke, of course, everybody knows Eisenhower's fear about the military industrial complex. What most people don't know is the first draft of Eisenhower's speech actually spoke of the military industrial congressional complex until his congressional aides told him he had to take that bit out. Now these are good souls who got it. And we need those good souls to inspire us to find a way to strike at this root, this root, not this pretty root here, but what is the root of the problem that this democracy now faces? Well, I don't know a better explanation than in this book by Robert Kaiser, So Damn Much Money, describing the rise of a new form of lobbying, what he describes as a kind of economy an economy that has lobbyists benefiting members, members benefiting interests, interests benefiting the lobbyists. It's a system of dependence where members are dependent on lobbyists who are dependent on special interests, which of course translates into interests controlling members in this marionette Congress which produces the kind of legislation we all see. There's a currency to this dependence. It's not the standard dependence of drugs or alcohol. It's a dependence on money. And not money in brown paper bags. I'm not talking about Rob Lagojevich corruption. I'm talking about money to support campaigns. As the cost of campaigns has gone through the roof, members who spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress or get their party back in power become dependent not upon the people, but upon the funders. This economy, this dependency, this distraction has an effect. Its effect is policy that gets changed. Sometimes profitably, this study from the University of Kansas estimated the return on investment from the lobbying dollars spent to amend the American Jobs Creation Act. They found the return on investment was 22,000% good money if you can get it, and you can get it, it turns out, in D.C. Or this study just released last year at UCLA describes how for every dollar spent trying to lobby to lower taxes for big corporations, they achieved a 6 to $20 reduction in the taxes those corporations paid. Sometimes brazenly. So this story, oops, New York Times, sorry. This story from the New York Times at the beginning of February describes how Chuck Schumer went back to Wall Street to raise money for him and the Democratic Party, but was met with a chilly reception, as the paper put it. Cities titans of finance at a recent closed-door meeting accused him of being insufficiently pro-Wall Street. One indignant fellow stood up and demanded his donation back. Now remember, this is Chuck Schumer. There is no person in the United States Congress more more responsible for deregulating Wall Street than Schumer, but he is not sufficiently pro-Wall Street for Wall Street. Or sometimes just grotesquely, here are the top 10 hedge fund managers from last year. How much money do you think these people made, each of them, on average last year? Just give me a number. 30 million? 1 billion? 2.5 billion dollars on average. Okay, how much tax did they pay on that 2.5 billion dollars? I assume not many of you made 2.5 billion dollars, but just extrapolate from the tax you paid on what you made. <laughs> You'd be wrong. They paid 15 percent on their 2.5 billion dollars because the way that income is allowed to be categorized. Obama came to office promising to change that, took the idea to Congress. Congress said, are you kidding? We can't make these guys our enemies. So this policy continues to this day. This economy of influence is the root for the insanity that guides this institution right now. And we have rewarded this institution with the respect they deserve. 11% of Americans have confidence in Congress today. There were more people who believed in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who believe in our Congress today. Now, the only way we can strike at the root of this is an idea that Teddy Roosevelt had a hundred years ago, citizen-funded elections. 
The idea of clean elections is simple. Create an optional system of campaign funding where qualified candidates can receive public money in exchange for the promise that they refuse large contributions from big money donors. These clean candidates then would be free from the fundraising circuit and if elected responsible only to their constituents. Laws based on this concept have been successfully enacted in several states and to date have been performing reasonably well. Locally we wanted the same thing for New York State and in 2008 placed this full page ad in the Democrat and Chronicle to encourage voters to call reps in support. But then on January 21, 2010 the Supreme Court and Citizens United v. the Federal Election Commission decided that corporations and unions have the constitutionally guaranteed free speech right to spend unlimited amounts of money to support or attack candidates for political office. This decision cuts the heart out of existing campaign finance law. Listen to the reaction of one half of the McCain-Feingold partnership. No, not Chuck Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, for your courtesy, Senator Kerry, uh, for allowing me to testify at this point. The Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United was a tragic error. The court reached out to change the landscape of election law in a drastic and wholly unnecessary way. By acting in such an extreme and unjustified manner, the court has badly damaged its own integrity. More important, it has harmed our democracy in ways that may not be fully understood today but will likely become clear over the next few election cycles. But by completely removing all restraints on political spending from corporate treasuries, Citizens United has unleashed a threat of enormous spending that simply was not possible before. And as we all know, a threat of retaliation at election time may be all that is needed to make a legislator think twice about opposing the already powerful voice of corporate America. All it takes is one senator losing a close election because of a last-minute corporate advertising barrage, and everyone will constantly have one eye on what might happen to them. That is why this decision is so dangerous. It will result in legislators being even more responsive to corporations rather than voters. Now, the underlying rationale for the court's decision, the corporations must have First Amendment rights in the political process equal to those of citizens, makes no sense. Corporations can't vote or run for office. They don't have feelings or thoughts. They don't speak or make decisions except through individuals, their corporate officers, their board of directors, and their lobbyists. What they do have is the ability to make huge amounts of money, thanks in part to laws passed by the people's representatives. So the court's ruling has, in effect, produced a Frankenstein. The people created corporations, but the court has denied the people the power to prevent corporations from dominating the entire political system. This terrible decision deserves as robust a response as possible. Nothing less than the future of our democracy is at stake, and I do thank you, Mr. Chairman. But being focused on his own legislation, there is a very important point former Senator Feingold fails to recognize. This flawed decision knocks clean elections out of the water further exacerbating big money's lock on the people's elections. Let me explain why. Suppose for a moment that clean elections advocates, like me, had achieved nirvana. Ideal loophole-free legislation is in place covering every office in the nation, from president to town dog catcher. Let me explain why. But first, a little background on how we got to where we are. Was it corrupt politicians? Or a Wall Street conspiracy? Or simply egregious personal greed? Surely all of these factors played minor roles, but these are second order terms in a predictable equation of natural evolution. Consider this. 
Modern American society is comprised of an intricate web of interwoven systems, and two of the most important are the systems of government and economics. Our government is based on a representative democracy which, in theory, seeks to enforce the will of the people. Our economics are based on a system of free markets, driven by capitalism, which focuses exclusively on two things, revenue growth and cost reduction. Now, as we all know, corporations are structures of capitalism, created by the people, which relentlessly pursue these two things. Now, this is not intrinsically bad. This arrangement produces many benefits for employees, investors, and the general public alike, except that without thoughtful boundary conditions, this corporate pursuit can lead to unintended consequences. The fact that trillions of dollars flow through government does not go unnoticed by the engine of capitalism. Corporations, by their very nature, view government as a large opportunity to grow revenue and reduce costs. And on this slide, you can see many lucrative examples of each. Still pending, but on the short list for privatization, is Social Security. Wall Street will not rest until this multi-trillion dollar opportunity is captured. Interesting also is the almost off the mainstream radar privatization of intelligence gathering. Since 9-11, both the FBI and CIA have come to depend upon private firms for covert information gathering. These are companies founded and operated by agents trained by the FBI and CIA who now do their work privately for substantially more money. And since they are private, they can provide their services for any client who can pay. Think corporations, news agencies, and political organizations, just to name a few. Furthermore, corporations quickly learn that capturing these opportunities is easier if they had friends in decision-making positions. And the best way to ensure friends in high places is to put them there. Corporations do not invest this money out of a sense of altruism. They do it for the return. So let's take a look at what the Supreme Court has enabled. Big Oil, which directly supports candidates, can now take unlimited money directly from the corporate treasury and buy up as much TV time as they'd like. But being relentless seekers of ways to cut costs, they notice the public money flowing to clean candidates, and they think out loud, Hey, Jimmy, next election cycle, why don't you turn over a new leaf and refuse our money? It'll make you look better to the voters, and it'll save us millions. Hell, we'll even divert some of our savings directly into that Swiss bank account we set up for you. So Inhofe takes taxpayers' money, Big oil saves a bundle, and the average citizen is left holding the bag, affirming the opposition's frame for clean elections, welfare for politicians. At the highest level, the court has shattered legislative attempts to rein in the encroachment of our system of economics on our system of government. So where does that leave us? In hot water up to our necks. Who knows how to boil a frog? You can't just toss him into boiling water. He'll sense the heat and immediately jump out. But if you put him into water at room temperature and slowly turn the heat up, he won't notice. As long as there's flies to eat and football on TV, he'll be swimmingly happy until he croaks. Well, it's my observation that this is exactly what's happening to our democracy. Since even before the days of Eisenhower, corporate forces have been insinuating themselves into the workings of government. This isn't surprising, but what is surprising is how the water has become so hot over the past 50 years. And if we are unwilling or unable to turn down this heat, our democracy will surely die. So now let's take a look at some potential implications of this democracy-killing decision. The possibilities may seem surreal, 
but history is replete with complacent populations shocked into unexpected futures. Finally tonight, as promised, a special comment on the Supreme Court's ruling today in the case Citizens United v. Federal Election Commission. Today, the Supreme Court of Chief Justice John Roberts, in a decision that might actually have more dire implications than Dred Scott v. Sanford, declared that because of the alchemy of its 19th century predecessors in deciding that corporations had all the rights of people, any restrictions on how these corporate beings spend their money on political advertising are unconstitutional. In short, the First Amendment, free speech for persons, which went into effect in 1791, applies to corporations, which were not recognized as the equivalents of persons, until 1886. In short, there are now no checks on the ability of corporations or unions or other giant aggregations of power to decide our elections. None. They can spend all the money they want, and if they can spend all the money they want, sooner rather than later, they will implant the legislators of their choice in every office, from president to head of the visiting nurse service. And if senators and congressmen and governors and mayors and councilmen and everyone in between are entirely beholden to the corporations for election and re-election to office, soon they will erase whatever checks there might still exist to just slow down the ability of corporations to decide the laws. It is almost literally true that any political science fiction nightmare you can now dream up, no matter whether you are conservative or liberal, it is now legal. Because the people who can make it legal can now be entirely bought and sold. No actual citizens required in the campaign fundraising process. And the entirely bought and sold politicians can change any laws. And any legal defense you can structure now can be undone by the politicians who will be bought and sold into office this November or two years from now. And any legal defense which honest politicians can somehow wedge up against them this November or two years from now, that can be undone by the next even larger set of politicians who will be bought and sold into office in 2014 or 2016 or 2018. And now let's contemplate what the perfectly symmetrical money-driven world of that order might look like. Be prepared first for laws criminalizing or at least neutering unions. In today's court decision, they are the weaker of the non-human sisters unfettered by the court. So as in ancient Rome or medieval England, they will necessarily be strangled by the stronger sibling, the corporations, so that they pose no further threat to the corporation's total control of our political system. Be prepared then for the reduction of taxes for the wealthy and for the corporations and the elimination of the social safety nets for everybody else, because money spent on the poor means less money left for the corporations. Be prepared then for wars sold as the new products, which Andy Card once described them as, year after year as if they were new Fox reality shows, because military industrial complex corporations are still corporations. So what are you going to do about it? Russ Feingold told me today there might yet be ways to work around this, to restrict corporate governance and how corporations make and spend their money. I pointed out that any such legislation, even if it somehow sneaked past this, the last U.S. Senate, not funded by a generous gift from the Chubb Group, would eventually wind up in front of a Supreme Court, and whether or not John Roberts was still at its head would be irrelevant. The next nine men and women on the Supreme Court will get there not because of their judgment, nor even their politics. They will get there because they were appointed by purchased presidents and confirmed by purchased senators. This is what John Roberts did today. This is a Supreme Court-sanctioned murder of what little actual democracy is left in this democracy. It is government of the people, by the corporations, for the corporations. It is the Dark Ages. It is our Dred Scott. I would suggest a revolution, but a revolution against the corporations, the corporations that make all the guns and the bullets? Maybe it won't be this bad. Maybe the corporations, legally defined as human beings, but without the pesky occasional human attributes of conscience and compassion, maybe when handed the only keys to the electoral machine, they will simply not redesign America in their own corporate image. But let me leave you with this final question. After today, who's going to stop them? Good night and good luck. So, people, we've got a fight on our hands, a fight we must win. And to win, we must understand the exact nature of the battle. Many years ago, I learned some things about fighting in a boxing ring. I learned that it's not sufficient to train hard 
work on speed and hone tactics. One must study the opponent, learn his pattern behaviors, and plan a strategy to counter them. So who are your opponents, and how do they fight? Do you think health care is a basic human right that should be universally available, independent of ability to pay? Then you are in a money fight with the insurance and pharmaceutical industries, and your ideas are off the table. Do you have a sense of responsibility to protect our air, water, and land for future generations? Are you concerned with the implications of climate change? Then you are in a money fight with big oil, big coal, and big gas, and you are getting smoked. Do you feel a moral obligation to work for social and economic justice? Then you are in a money fight with Wall Street, and you are a cheap penny stock. Are you personally pained by the profound human suffering brought by unnecessary war? Then you are in a money fight with an entrenched defense industry, and American taxpayers are collateral damage. So recognize that we cannot win battles with powerful economic forces where money decides the victor. We must change the rules of engagement or we'll lose every important fight. What we need to do is ensure that ordinary citizens are represented in our legislative bodies. We need to restore government by and for the people. And given the recent rulings of the Supreme Court, only an amendment to the Constitution can affect this restoration. This will be a difficult road requiring massive citizen participation, fervor, and resolve, but it is the only road to a restored democracy. So join the local effort. Add your name to the online petition to amend the Constitution. Write editorials and blogs. Talk with your families and friends. Write your representatives, all of them, frequently. Compose a song, make a video, and post it on the Seditious Citizen YouTube channel. And finally, take a deep breath and get ready to rumble. <laughs> Corporations and their money by politicians every day. One year ago, the Supreme Court it took away the people's say. We gotta stop the money for oh, to save democracy. Come on, we the people, and keep our country free. So let the people run elections and take control from Goldman Sachs and free our senators and congressmen. Just redirect my income tax. Gotta stop the money. Oh, to save democracy. Return to we the people and keep our country free. Yeah! Come on.